This is my rambling reaction to what thoughts I have around the three readings designated for this week. The readings are Psalm 1, Matthew 22 verses 34 to 40 and 1 John chapter 4 verses 19 to 21. These readings made me think of Mother Julian of Norwich, the anchoress who lived in deliberate seclusion next to St Julian's Church in Norwich. No one actually knew her name for sure, so she took the name of the church her cell was attached to. During her time, the Black Death flourished, and in 1373, she was 30, she became seriously ill and experienced visions or showings that featured Christ's passion. As a therapist and considering context, I might see these as examples of transliminal experiences and they're extremely precious spiritual moments in a person's life. Unexpectedly, Julian recovered from her illness and wrote accounts of her interpretation of those visions and they became her manuscripts entitled the Revelations of Divine Love. It took 15 years for Julian to finally be resolved as to what those visions meant, and her conclusion is well known. And I'm going to quote from chapter 86 of what is called the Long Text. And note how her explanation reflects a past, a present and a future temporal aspects of God's love, because I think that's important. So I'm going to read from chapter 86 now, and this is her book, by the way, that obviously that's a depiction of her. So this is from chapter 86. And from the time that this was revealed, I often yearned to know what our Lord's meaning was. And 15 years and more later, I was answered in my spiritual understanding. And it was said, do you want to know your Lord's meaning in this? Be well aware, love was his meaning. Who showed you this? Love. What did he show you? Love. Why did he show you it? For love. Hold fast to this and you will know and understand more of the same, but you will never understand nor know anything else from this for all eternity. So reflecting upon these readings and thinking about Christ's commands, for me, Julian reflects the essence of of Psalm 1 verse 2. Julian meditating on God's law day and night and her delight in concluding that God's message to her was love was his meaning. I think we're entering into the realms of agape here, unconditional love born from moral goodwill and pure altruism. That reciprocal love God has shown for us and that same love Christ commands us to share with God and with each other. Let's leave aside for a moment other biblical Greek words for love which appear in the biblical narratives. The words such as philio, storge and I don't think eros appears in the New Testament either but I'm happy to be corrected. So for me, what do you make of 1 John 4 verse 19? We love because he loved us first. This echoes and endorses Julian's interpretation of her vision in that this represents a decent prid pro quo. We are hearing of the primacy of God's love here his love for us, since we are his priority. And God's law offers us the opportunity to reciprocate that preeminent love 
in an all-inclusive relationship with him. But what happens if we don't make the grade? And I go back now to Psalm 1, verse 6. For the Lord watches over the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Ah, mm, so now I'm thinking, mm, what's so all-inclusive and unconditional about that part of God's love? That God will see people punished. Here's the therapist in me speaking and some controversy for you. Is this a reflection within the Old Testament biblical narrative of the fears and expectations about punishment being projected into the text by its authors? Or it could be demonstrating the biblical author's earthly reasons for instigating manipulation or control to the intended audience. Have a read of 1 John 4 verse 18 and then see what you think. That's some feminist theology for you. And actually I can recommend Rowan Williams. His essay in this one is very good. It's called On Being Creatures and it takes you further along on that debate. It's worth reading. And as my friends at Easton will tell you, I'm very fond of Julian because she was probably one of the first theologians to view God as mother as well as father. Anyway, when Julian asked God about the existence of sin and the goodness of God, Jesus answered her, and I'm going to read now from chapter 27. Again, I'm reading from the long text. And this is what the showings said to her. But Jesus, who in this vision informed me of everything needful to me, answered with these words and said, sin, sin is befitting, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Note the use of the future tense there, said three times over. I wonder what this is directing us to. Do we trust in God's love for us, despite how we might fail? Perhaps we need to look towards the cross for our answer. Through Christ's redemptive death upon that cross, we are united and dependent upon God's love and through that sacrificial divine love. Well, as cynical Jill, I'd be the one probing Jesus for answers. And in true Pharisaic custom, as shown in Matthew 22, Jesus is asked how we can know which commandment of law is the greatest. What should we be aiming for? Jesus clarifies and says that loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind has preeminence here. Even before we begin working our way through any of the other love vocabulary linked to feeding the hungry and caring for neighbours. In fact, I sense Christ's answer tells us something extremely fundamental here about what loving God might mean. There is something about getting the basic bit right first, akin to laying a foundation stone. And note how Jesus' message here is in the present tense, and it encompasses an all-inclusive personal identification with heart, soul and mind. So it's all or nothing. And I think this may lead us to the most relevant question of all. And that's why does loving God have preeminence? But I wonder if the author of 1 John is encouraging us to apply some wider thinking here. And it's what I term helicopter view. He's asking us, how on earth can we even claim to love God, who we have never had any visual experience of, 
If we claim not to be very keen on certain people or dislike some of those we have relatedness to. So I wonder if the preeminence of loving God is all about because we exist. It's because we are. And I'm drawn to think the commandment of Christ has its origins in God's act of creation itself. Ex nihilo, ex amore, out of nothing and out of love. God didn't have to instigate creation. He called into being all that didn't exist. Thus, relatedly, everything created becomes caught up and with and through God. God as creator, God as son and redeemer, and God as spirit expands our view of seeing God's creation as an act motivated by divine love, of which Christ and you and me and those people we find tricky are all part. Yes, set the Facebook page to it's complicated because it, because it is. But I sense Christ is subtly reminding us to acknowledge, honour and progress this, to progress this divine love. It's continual work in progress. It's alive. It's now. And for me personally, that's inspirational too. It's the beautiful, invisible, mysterious crossover, like celestial osmosis, if you like, where theology becomes the pastoral, where we actualize our Christian faith. Christ says, love your neighbor, open yourself out to what God has offered you, ex amore. And motivated with compassion and empathy, pay it on forward to those who are entitled to their share, those who we find tricky, and to those our material world has forgotten. I'm just going to end with a very short prayer. It's a prayer by Sister Penny Roker. Some of you may have known her. She did spend some time in Peterborough. In our making, we had beginning, but the love with which he made us was in him without beginning. And in that love, we have our beginning. And all this shall be seen in God without end. This may Jesus grant us.